when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. What exists, reality itself, is gorgeous. It is the plenum, the fullness of total joy. The universe is a celebration. It's a firework show to celebrate that existence is. Wow, we. For those of us seeking a life of meaning and purpose, capturing fulfillment in every moment of now, seeking the truth of our reality so we can live this life to its fullest. This is the Live This Life Podcast. And I'm your host, Hugh Cummings. I'm here to inspire you to ask yourself the question every day. Are you living party killing time? want to become self-actualized, if you want to live a life of meaning, the first thing you have to do is become independent of the good opinion of other people. The first thing you have to do. And the second thing is to become detached from the outcome. Those were the two, no, the top two criteria for, for highly functioning people. Independent of the good opinion of other people, which is exactly the opposite of what we learned in the ambition phase of our life. We don't go out there to try to make, you know, to, to do something to make a lot of money. That's, you know, detachment from outcome is like you don't do it because of how much money you're going to make. You do it because there's something inside of you here that is telling you this is what you're here for. This is what you have to create. This is what your purpose is. You're going to make the world a better place. You're going to fulfill a destiny, a dharma that you signed up for, you know, when, before you even entered your mother's womb. I mean, that that's the kind of thing that you begin to to feel inside of yourself. Capacity for speech is divine. It's the thing that generates order from chaos. Don't underestimate the power of truth. There's nothing more powerful. Now, in order to speak what you might regard as the truth, you have to let go of the outcome. You have to think, all right, I'm going to say what I think. Stupid as I am, biased as I am, ignorant as I am. I'm going to state what I think as clearly as I can, and I'm going to live with the consequences no matter what they are. That's an element of faith. The idea is that nothing brings a better world into being than the stated truth. There are many philosophers' dictums that live strong in our history books and in the stories passed down through the ages. Those tales tell us about the great thinkers and the pioneering minds of the past, what they went through in the dark shadows of human history, those stories are intended to awaken the masses to a higher level of perceiving our reality and the world around us. The archetypal teacher like Buddha, Jesus, Yoda, Morpheus. Their common thread is they're often molding the open mind of the student who are willing to listen while simultaneously engaged in battle with the darker forces of our world, which are more often than not the ruling elite. And in many cases, like in Socrates' case, they are put to death for what they teach and believe in. And although in our modern society we might look at something like crucifixion or execution simply for your beliefs as a primitive act, but in a way we're still doing the same exact thing to people who have differing opinions from those of the majority. The unexamined life is not worth living. Socrates. Unplug from your regularly scheduled and scripted life program. Turn off the media. It's time to get it growing again. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the first episode of the fourth season of the Live This Life podcast. Uh, I am so very excited to finally be back on the microphone. It has been so long, and I am just ready to go for this season. I'm ready to dive in this subject today, uh, but I have to say, I very much missed you guys. I very much, very much missed being on this microphone. Definitely a little rusty here already, I can tell, um, but I'm ready to get this going again. There have been a lot of big things changing in this off season, and a lot of cool stuff has happened. It's uh, it's definitely been a labor of love. It's been a lot of work. 
Um, as you can see, the surroundings around me have definitely changed quite a bit. Um, we have a new studio, a lot of new gadgets in here. We got cameras here and cameras there, and I've got cameras I haven't even used yet. <laughs> um, but a lot of different stuff, a whole different look and a whole different feel. Definitely going to be a different uh, stream of content that's going to be coming at you as well. Not a huge divergent from the path that we've already been on. Um, just a little bit more raw and real and a lot of things I want to talk about that I've kind of bit my lip on. So, uh, but yeah, back to the look of the place. Um, if you're watching the video version, uh, which we will be doing every single episode from this point forward on video, you can see the video versions through Spotify. Uh, Spotify acquired Anchor, which we've been with Anchor from the start. One of the best places that you can use to start a podcast and they made it pretty much seamless to create a video podcast and have it turn right into audio so you can see it on spotify if you go on there you can see the video um, you can also view this on youtube as well the the live this life youtube channel i have these links in the show notes uh, but the youtube channel is very young very fledgling doesn't have a lot on there but that's going to change in the next few months as well i'll be putting up some exclusive content some of these these walks out in nature in these times where i've just got things I'm in the flow and I'm out in nature and I'm doing my thing and uh, not exactly podcast worthy, but definitely would make some great videos and stuff. So, um, and if you're also here in Western Massachusetts, you can catch this on BNC TV. They have graciously uh, continued to air the video version of the show. Although I've given them the warning that the content may change a little, a little more edgy, a little different energy going into the whole thing. Uh, but they have said that they are, 100% uh, behind it. And I'm very grateful to even have that opportunity to be on their station. So that's another cool development. Um, but yeah, totally different look to everything. Uh, you'll notice maybe a little, little bit of a, see if I can get it on camera here, a little live this life apparel. Uh, some of the things that we've been moving on, I was hoping to have the store open on livethislife.org to have some of these things ready, but I did a few test pieces of the apparel, didn't quite like the quality. So I got a little bit more work to do in that area. And I didn't want to delay doing the episodes and getting the season going for another reason. It's always been something, it's the studio, it's the equipment, it's this, it's that. Um, so I just need to get the, get the fire lit here and get it going. So um, other exciting changes, we're gonna have our amazing co-pilot Alexis McQuillan. She's going to be coming back for this next season as well. She's got a lot of things going on in her life, a lot of awesome travels that she's been going on, kind of jealous of her most recent one where she's been out in Hawaii and I'm up here in the Northeast freezing with it being like negative three degrees tonight. Um, but yeah, she's, uh, she's got a lot of things going on in her world, but she's going to come and join us as often as she possibly can. And we're very, very fortunate to have her there. Uh, some awesome perspectives on things that she's going to be bringing to the show that are just beyond my realm and they completely fascinate me and I know they're going to fascinate you too. So very excited for that. Uh, new logo, new podcast cover. If you might have noticed um, new intro, if you've seen the video version, the new intro was inspired by some of my very favorite filmmakers, Les Stroud, uh, Mike Stanley, Definitely had some inspiration from some of the stuff that they, they do and had some help from some amazing people along the way to get all of this stuff put together. So great stuff. I got some great new artists that are going to be featured on the show in the closing. We play that music at the end very often, and we're going to be adding to the great lineup of artists that we have for that, as well as probably the most exciting part is we got a new book to read. Uh, we are going to be featuring probably one of, if not probably my ultimate favorite book that I've ever read on as far as transformative thought provoking, um, spiritual awesomeness, but the book oneness by the amazing author Rasha, she is actually going to potentially join us on an episode. Once we finish the book, um, if you're into spirituality and not so much in like a religious sense, but in the sense of trying to find and understand the connection to the creator or whatever that energy is. Um, that's what that book is all about. And it was fascinating. You know, it was I basically it came into my path at a point where um, religion kind of fell apart for me a little bit. Uh, just learning a lot about different organized religions, not really jiving with 100% of any certain religion. I would consider myself an, an omnist. Definitely lean more towards uh, Christianity. Definitely followed it a lot. I think there's a lot of things that we don't fully understand about Christianity because it's been so heavily changed over the years. Um, but ultimately, 
it's that connection. It's that connection to whatever we came from and that source. And in this book, Rasha talks about these amazing downloads that she had. Um, and we'll go, we'll dive into that one a lot more in the very first episode that we read that book, but it is going to blow you away. It's one of the awesomest books and I am over the moon excited that she's given us the rights to feature this one. Uh, just one of the many unexpected, awesome turn of events that has happened in that one just in the last few days. Um, but the show again, uh, just keeps on having awesome momentum put behind it. So, um, it's part of the huge delay of starting everything just because something new pops up. So eventually I just have to say enough's enough. Let's get this going. Let's get back on the air, get some episodes going again and get out there and, uh, get things moving and shaking. So, um, yeah, and that's exactly what's been happening. A lot of things been moving and shaking over the past few months. Um, it's actually been almost four months since I've done an episode, uh, just a lot of work to be done and uh, definitely a lot of digging, a lot of inner work that I had to do in this off season uh, because between seasons three and four, I vowed that I was going to be coming at this entire thing with a lot more intention and purpose, you know, and that's something that I've encouraged you to do some, since I started this podcast. It is something that I have preached time and time again throughout the course of this show through the many people I've interacted with the people that I've worked one-on-one -on -one with it's something that I think builds the ultimate recipe for success in all of us is that we have to come at the things that we have in our life whether it's being a parent if you're at a certain job if you're moving on a certain dream if you have a certain goal in your life you can't half-ass it because if you do you're going to get half-ass results and that's ultimately what I was getting with the show. I was actually getting better than half-ass half -ass results, which amazes me because it was doing really well. And it was basically, you know, fourth on the priority list of all the different things in my life. And it was doing it when I had time and then turning attention to it. And I'd get an episode out sometimes three weeks at a time. And I vowed that I was going to do more with this. It deserved more. You all deserve more. There are people who, when we got the statistics from Spotify, this was so many people's top show and it blew me away. We were in the top 10 percentile of all of the podcasts worldwide, which I think it's about two and a half million podcasts now. We were in the top 10% of shows that were shared on social media or other networking, whether it was text message or anything else. So. All of you listeners out there, you'd listen to something and you'd share an episode or send the link to somebody. And we're in the top 10% in the world to have that privilege. So, and that was with, I guess, essentially a half-ass effort. Although that half-ass half -ass effort was still a lot of work back when I was doing it in season three and everything before that. So, you know, in this time off, I had to approach it with, okay, what do I want it to look like? What do I want it to sound like? And what do I want this to turn out to be? And ultimately, I said, I, you know, I want this to turn out to be as great as it can be. There are people who are out there whose shows I listen to, and not to knock anybody, but I definitely think we do a much better job with the content and the conversations and everything else. So uh, I definitely think we have the chance to turn this into something much bigger. So I'm going to approach it with that mindset in, in an effort to practice what I preach, the things I give advice to people for is that I'm going to do the same exact thing, you know, and I've got to tell you, it's definitely something to sit here and realize when you're, you're digging and you're journaling and you're trying to figure things out in your life, which direction you want to go. It's, it's a certain thing to realize like, wow, I'm sitting here telling people to do a certain thing and I'm, you know, telling them do this, that, and the other thing, X, Y, and Z, and you're going to get to the certain result in your life. And then here I am realizing that I'm not getting the results in my own life because I'm not following my own advice. I mean, that's, that's a real moment. It doesn't sound like much to you guys, but for somebody who I guess prides themselves on, on having their shit together for the most part, um, I felt like at that moment, I just was a complete screw up. You know, people like me who seem like they have everything together, like they've got things figured out and they've got things going for them. I felt like a complete screw up in those moments. They, we all have them. We all have those moments. And it, the most important part is you take those moments, you learn from them, you dust yourself off and you move forward. So um, in an effort to not feel like that further, I defined where I was going to have it go. 
and uh, we're gonna we're gonna get it there. We're gonna go and see where this goes. Uh, it's just been a big growing process, and you know, in all fairness, I had hit the ground running when we started the show late in 2019. I had no idea where it was gonna go. I've, many of you heard this story before, but it was you know maybe just gonna be a few episodes to say, hey, I did a podcast this one time, one day back and whenever. Um, and I literally had no idea what the hell I was doing. I cringe when I listen to some of those earlier episodes and, uh, I had no idea where it was going to end up, but you know, here we are three full seasons in the books, starting our fourth season. We're in over 110 countries now and just, it's been doing amazing. I mean, the stats flew through the roof in the, uh, in the off season as well. So I have all of you to thank for that. And now coming at it with full intention to sort of pay back everybody else coming at it with everything I've got and going to bring you guys some pretty awesome stuff. So, um, you know, I've got the intention to, to bring this all the way to the top and aim high and see where it goes. Who knows? Maybe this could become one of the world's top podcasts someday. Uh, you know, so given what we've seen, given what we've, uh, what we've heard out of people's stories, this is, this is how some of those stories start. So, Let's see where it goes, right? Um, you know, I, I examined where I could potentially end up with this entire thing, and I said, "Yeah, that sounds great. Let's uh, let's see where it goes. Let's get it going." So, and you know what they say about the the destination? Uh, you know, the journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step. So, I'm setting that destination, and we're going to begin that very long journey. We're going to start it today. Let's start it right now. Stop rambling. Let's get into today's subject. And I'll get back to that quote that I mentioned at the beginning. The unexamined life is not worth living. Now, this one was a famous quote that was supposedly uttered by Socrates in his trial for impiety, which that means his lack of respect. He was put on trial for his lack of respect. Basically, his lack of respect for the political version of God that existed in his time, the the political version of God that the ruling elite of his time were teaching people and didn't allow people to really diverge from those teachings. And he was ultimately accused of corrupting the youth of Athens, where he lived in Athens, Greece. He was ultimately accused of corrupting not just the youth, everybody, but primarily the youth. That was their biggest uh, concern. But he was ultimately accused of corrupting the youth of Athens and was put on trial as a direct result. So if you're not familiar with Socrates and you're starting to dive into the many rabbit holes of philosophy like I was, philosophy is something that in recent years has just completely fascinated me. Um, if I had more spare time, and I'm not saying I won't do it in the near future, but I would love to to actually do formal studies in, in philosophy. I think it is something that is just completely fascinating and just opens up your mind towards all sorts of different potentials. And, you know, philosophy is like religion. Uh, you know, a, a religion is a faith. A faith is a belief. A belief is a philosophy. A philosophy, you know, goes round and round in circles. I've said this before. And uh, one of the most famous philosophers in human history is Socrates. And um, I'd say he's probably one of really the first in recorded modern history. And when I say modern history, I mean, this was 2000 years ago, over 2000 years ago. Um, but when we talk about modern history, uh, you know, the modern history of the human species, the, the human species, they say are, you know, our civilization, I should say, they say our species has been around for 200,000 years, but uh, modern civilization's only been around for about 8,000 years from what mainstream academia has taught us. But um, well, actually what we've seen in the last couple of years, that's definitely changing. That paradigm is changing a lot. Um, a lot of mainstream academia, you know, in archaeology, everybody who's studying these concepts of the past are discovering new things. And it's very hard for them to keep new ideas under wraps and locked away in their little their little vaults and their boxes and you know the 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 truth starts to ooze out and at this point it's with the age of of social media and how quick people share things and stuff it's hard to hide concepts and and ideas like this and it's a lot more people are out there asking the questions what if and they want they want better answers they want answers that make sense to them and i think that's one of the biggest things is that a lot of things were spoon fed to people throughout the past few millennia and people just kind of went along with them. But I think the the norm, the people who are breaking out in society, people like you who are listening to shows like this, you know, there's more to life than what most of us have. 
Most of us are actually, let's not say let's what we've had, it's what we have had. Historically, we have just basically been told to wake up, go to work and come home, do it for 40, 50 years, and then you get to enjoy your life afterwards. And when I looked at my life and I faced mortality several times in my, my fights against cancer and my previous career of actually watching people pass away in front of me and wondering, you know, what is life all about? Like, are we, uh, are we supposed to just sit here and, and suffer? You know, are we supposed to be here in bondage? Are we supposed to just live these lives that just seem just gruesomely unfulfilling just to pass away? And, and that was it. Like, no, no, we are here for so much more. Even if we, in this social construct we're all in right now, have to live these lives where we do have to go to work and we do have to do something to earn a paycheck to um, to sustain ourselves. Our lives don't still have to fit in those tiny little boxes of just serve, go home, sleep, repeat, and that's it. That's all we have. More people are opening their eyes and their minds and they're listening to things like this and digesting all sorts of information from so many different avenues and so many different tar- uh, areas that concepts are are constantly blooming and evolving and knowledge isn't as easy to suppress as it has been over the last you know 100 to 200 years in mainstream academia um i've had colleagues in in mainstream academia when i was in higher ed and doing all sorts of different things um saw a lot of cool stuff behind the scenes when i was doing art crime investigation and, and heard a lot of stories about how things would get dug up things would be discovered they would basically go behind lock and key. The Smithsonian was huge on this stuff. That place is like a black hole of treasures and finds that are pulled up, pulled away, and never get to see the light of day again. A um, lot of cool stories I could tell about the the, the art stuff, the, the museum stuff. And I'll, I'll definitely have to dive into some of those things with you guys every once in a while. Um, but basically new ideas and concepts would come up and they wouldn't actually make it to the classrooms of academia because these professors who would teach for 40 or 50 years would teach a prescribed school of thought. They would teach thousands of students the same thing. History was this way. And if something new came up, that would threaten pretty much everything they ever taught anyone. They have all these people who would come to their classrooms who essentially would have learned something that wasn't real. It wasn't the real history because we learned something else to the contrary. And that's a hard pill for them to swallow. That's a real hard pill for somebody with a very big ego, which a lot of a lot of higher ed faculty have some of the hugest egos I've ever encountered. And they just can't take that hit. So a lot of times some new ideas and pieces of information would be suppressed. They would not be taught. And, you know, I, I guess I've had people I've, I've talked about this many times and I've had people ask me, why would anybody who's in the world of educating people want to dumb people down? Why would they want to keep people down? Uh, why would they want to basically be at odds with humanity and, and keep people in the dark? And I guess the, the I've asked the same question. I've asked the same question of people who I've gotten a lot of this information from and had some pretty awesome discussions behind, you know, off camera and everything else. And basically the explanation I got is one that has made a lot more sense to me in the last couple of years. And that is that if we, the people, if we, the general populace, these these people in classrooms, all of us that are out there making the world turn, if we, the people wake up and we as a human species, we as a collective realize that this is a game and that the game is over and we decide to stop playing this game, that means that the power structure of the people who make those decisions at the top falls apart and it ends. And this game that we play is supported on our backs. This monopoly board is set up on our backs. And if we decide to stand up and we decide not to play anymore, that board falls and the pieces fall to the ground. So the people who make these decisions that could ultimately give power and knowledge to people that could cause the power structure to fall apart. So basically they have everything to gain if they keep this charade going, they keep the narrative going and they have everything to lose if it disintegrates. So they do whatever they have to do to keep 
it going. And we've seen a lot of different acts of desperation in the last few years. And this modern era isn't so much different than this story that we'll tell about Socrates. Socrates came up in an era where people were very heavily controlled by the Roman Catholic Church. And the emperors and the bishops and the priests and everything of his time were the ones who were ultimately in control. They had great amounts of power and control. And if you didn't believe the way that they believed, they would pretty much just straight up take you out. They would take you out of society. You would either be put into exile or you would be put on trial and killed like Socrates was. They saw Socrates as a threat to their power. And he was teaching people basically not to listen to the ruling elite. And they didn't like that. They saw him as one of the biggest threats, just like they saw portions of the Bible as a threat. Um, that's that's 100% correct. Those people of that time that were in the ruling class, they supposedly removed um, many books from the Bible. Not supposedly, they actually did. In the Council of Nicaea, I think it was year 325 AD, they all met and they took a bunch of different portions of the Bible out and removed books. And they basically did it under the guise that, you know, these weren't things that uh, that belonged in there. They had no relevance. It, it, you know, it wasn't uh, the true word of God or it wasn't the things they wanted to teach going forward. So they basically, politicians, chose to take these holy scriptures, these books that were wrote, you know, they were written thousands of years maybe before that had human history. They destroyed them. They basically took them out and they destroyed any trace of them. They tried to destroy any trace of uh, any opposing views and got rid of these things and made these decisions on what the world was going to learn about these holy words going forward. Um, you know, and basically that carried forward into what we know now as the modern Christian religion. And that's what I had a problem with when I learned that entire thing about what happened that made Christianity really, uh, in its entire sense, but the modern version of it. Now, you, you definitely have different thing, different rabbit holes you can go down to to look at the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Lost Gospel of St. Thomas. Like, that one was mind-blowing. The Lost Gospel of St. Thomas is primarily just a bunch of quotes about things Jesus said. Why wouldn't those be in their uh, their Bible? That, I figured that would be like the the focal point of it. Um, but they took it out because a lot of the things that they, they actually took out put the power back in the person, in my opinion. And I, I've heard some talks on this. The, the things that were took out, uh, taken out and then that were suppressed were basically telling people that the true power was within us because ultimately everything is connected. You know, our connection to the all, the universe, the source, the creator, it didn't lie out there in a building called a church and it didn't have to hinge on the approval or disapproval of a vengeful God. It did not uh, depend on how much you donated or, or you know, put in the, the plate that was passed around and it didn't matter what the guy in the robe standing at the altar said. The teachings taught us that our true power has been and always will be within us and that our connection to source is a universal law it's something that is just inherent within every single one of us and if we had that it would take the power structure out of the church of that time so i definitely can see why if that was their agenda why they would take it out um but this this connection to everything is something that continues to be substantiated you know they they can say that they took it out for whatever reasons but you know, we're finding out through scientific experiments now, modern scientific experiments, that these philosophies of saying everything is connected and everything is all one and everything, it, it is. I mean, the the 2022 Nobel Prize winning uh, quantum physics experiments, these two uh, these two scientists won a Nobel, Peace, uh, Nobel Prize because of their expanded understandings of how quantum entanglement worked. And basically quantum entanglement is basically saying that every particle in the universe was squashed down to this infinitesimally small point. It was all connected at one point and when everything blasted outward or did whatever it did, they all remained connected. The, the scientific experiments proved that everything in the universe is still connected. You can move two particles millions of light years apart and you can do something to one of them, you know, basically you can split that particle and do something to one over here and the other one will instantaneously react. 
And that violates Einstein's theories of relativity. It moves faster than the speed of light. And the only way to explain these experiments they've proven time and time again is with the experiments uh, and the, the ultimate results of quantum entanglement, saying that everything is ultimately connected. And this goes all the way down to like the hermetic principles. One of the one of the hermetic principles says that everything is vibration. Everything moves, everything vibrates. That didn't make any sense really. It just seemed whimsical until they did these experiments with the Large Hadron Collider and smashed the smallest particles. They'd smash particles and it would break into smaller unknown particles and they would name them and then they would take those and they'd smash those smaller ones together. Eventually they smashed things down to the point where they couldn't be broken apart anymore and it just came to a field of vibration that was the smallest thing down at the Planck length. Planck length. It couldn't get any smaller. And that field down at that area was just a vibrating field of quantum foam is what they called it. And out of that foam, the first emergent particles of the known universe emerge from those. So that hermetic principle written thousands of years ago that everything is vibration was proven with modern experiments now. So these things aren't just whimsical and it wasn't the place of any politician to remove books from the Bible and make those decisions. And when people say that it was basically done to maintain power and control, it's the only real thing that makes sense because it ultimately wasn't for people's good because there's a lot of great information that was removed. When you realize that it was basically taken out because it was an ultimate threat to their power and influence, that's when everything changes. And that goes all the way back from antiquity up to now. Basically, anybody's independence now is a threat to power structures because power and control go hand in hand. And when the people of ancient Athens were listening to Socrates and they were being taught that they had the power to think how they wanted to, they had the power to shake the paradigm of that time, the ruling elite didn't like it. And Socrates was the one teaching that. So ultimately he was put in their crosshairs. And just like every alternative thought path, every alternative spiritual belief of that time as well from all around the world, they were made a target of the, the Roman Catholic Church. The Crusades went around pretty much squashing the opposition and converting everybody to Christianity, you know, basically converting everybody to their way. And Socrates was one of those people who stood up against that. He was just like a lot of the modern truth bringers that are out there now that are facing cancel culture which is really just a modern form of exile, in my own opinion, and many other people's. You know, it, it's unfortunate, but we really haven't evolved that much when you think about it. We really haven't changed much from those ideologies because back then they, they turned a blind eye. All these people actually watched this trial. It was one of the biggest things going on in that time. What's different now? We have social media, so you have millions of people watching these people basically go on trial, and not many people stand up to support the people who are on trial, who are basically getting put through the ringer, having their livelihoods taken away, their reputations ruined, because they're going against the status quo and questioning a mainstream narrative. So, you know, if you look at the old school thoughts of forcing someone into exile and ridicule or potentially death and ruining their life, all the way up to what we're doing now for the sake of maintaining power and control, we haven't really changed that much. You know, what we, we would view as a primitive thought of those times hasn't really evolved that much. We might not be as brutal as putting people to death for their ideas, but I mean, it's one of the next worst things is ruining somebody's entire livelihood and reputation because they had the courage ultimately to stand up against something they didn't think was right and just asked people to say what if what if this alternative narrative is actually true you don't have to throw it out believe it whatever you're going to do but at least let it be what it's going to be and and discern what was true or what wasn't the social constructs of those times are not much different than now and um certain people became outsiders and if you were a potentially dangerous outsider in the eyes of the ruling elite and the ruling elite were able to convince the the uh the majority the social majority of that time that was where their power lies and not much has changed since then um it's not so much i guess the the ruling elite because they're limited in their size it's their 
their way that they can convince the masses, you know, it's whatever they can say to get people on their side. And when the masses are convinced towards something, no matter how much of a, a lie or a hoax or embellished truth it might be, that is ultimately where the tides of change can move or not. It is where an accepted norm might actually be. And, you know, with, with Socrates, you know, I guess you can say he was one of the first people who faced cancel culture in kind of an extreme way. Um, but at his trial, you know, they, they offered him the opportunity to basically live in exile. You know, he had to leave Athens and never return. Get out of here. The trial's in six months. Don't, don't ever come back and you won't be put to death. Um, and if you stay, you're likely going to face death. So you make that decision. Um, and he chose to stay and people never really figured out why. And, uh, he, he pretty much uttered that quote that the unexamined life wasn't going to be worth living because if he was put into exile, he wasn't going to live a life of truth. He was going to go somewhere else and basically be faced with the same set of circumstances. And, you know, if he got to stay where he was and continue to be who he wanted to be, that was the life he wanted to ultimately choose. So it was almost like give me liberty to give me death. You know, his words, his words may not have been shouted through social media or through a megaphone or on a, on a mountaintop, but his, his stance echoed through the ages. His, his position that he took on the entire situation is one that should give everybody contemplation for a whole different range of different ideas. You know, his entire community and his entire society had their eyes on that trial. Everybody was seeing what was going on. And they couldn't understand why he wasn't just choosing exile. And it was trying to convince them that this unexamined life, this, this life where I'm just going to listen to someone else's orders on what my life should be, isn't living life. That's, that's living someone else's life. That's following someone else's orders. And that ultimate message just echoed across the spans of time and it just went all the way up until now. And his story, this story of living the unexamined life is one that so many people have been inspired by and still pay attention to like myself, but so many people aren't even aware of it. And some people who have heard it haven't learned the lessons of that, that past mistake. Here we are, we're doing some of the same stuff all the way up to modern day. Um, so yeah, ultimately, Socrates died for what he believed in, which was literally nothing more than his thoughts turned into words, really. I mean, what did he do? He he taught some people that uh, you didn't have to listen to the ruling elite. You didn't have to do everything that they said. And ultimately, his internal concepts were the reason why he was put to death. And he did nothing more than basically ask the people who would listen to ask themselves why? Why were you doing anything in life? Examine your own life and ask yourself why you're doing anything at all. Are you doing it for yourself? Are you doing it for someone else? You're doing it because someone else told you it's the thing you're supposed to do. You know, that's why Socrates was so dangerous to the ruling elite of his time. He was put to death for corrupting people because he was basically getting them to think. That's it. He was getting them to think about their decisions based on reason rather than just taking everything for the ruling elite's words and the controlling powers decisions on what life was supposed to be like you know and i guess the relevance to this unexamined life concept is that our modern current world hasn't changed a whole lot you know and that's the reason why i wanted to open up this season and talk about this subject and we'll take a little bit more of a deeper dive in a moment. Uh, but before we dive too deep, I just wanted to mention that um, if you check out livethislife.org in the, la the next few weeks, we will have a mailing list available on there. Uh, a lot of different ways that we're going to be able to connect with you guys. We're going to potentially be putting up a Patreon. I hate talking about the things that I'm going to do and I like to present the results, but I want people to know that there are some great things that are coming up on tap um, and we have our great sponsors that are still here with us. And we've got some great messages and things that are lined up for everybody. Um, so stay tuned. We'll be right back. There's a lot of talk about the cost of eating healthy, but it's far less expensive when considering the price of sickness. 
That's why I've partnered the podcast from the start with one of the highest quality supplement companies on the planet, Organifi. Our food market in the Western world is more bombarded by carcinogens like glyphosate and preservative ingredients that you can't even pronounce, all of which have a detrimental effect on literally every part of your health. Being a two-time cancer survivor, I want to stay a survivor, which is why I do everything in my power to ensure that I'm living the healthiest life I can so I can be here for many years to come. That's why I turn to Organifi for all of my supplement needs. I start my day by adding the green juice and complete protein powder to my post-workout shake, and I end my day with the gold chocolate to help my mind and body recover from the demanding life that I live. I'm into my 40s and people ask me all the time, what's your secret recipe? And part of that answer is always Organifi. If you're serious about investing in your health, then adding Organifi to your daily healthy living regimen is a must. Head over to OrganifiShop.com. That's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I-S-H-O-P.com to check out their amazing line of products. If you find something that you want to dive into, use the promo code LIVETHISLIFE, all one word, and get 15% off of your purchase. So let's bring today's episode into why it's so relevant for me. Why did this one bubble up for me lately? Usually I I end up doing episodes based on something that's come up for me. And, you know, this one was the the biggest one. You know, there's a lot of things I want to talk about. I've got a lot of episodes already on tap. But, you know, what what, what was it about this one that made me want to start off the season uh, with this concept? And I guess... One of the biggest things I wanted to dive into, you know, one of the things I teased out when I was trying to figure out like what direction I wanted to take the show and why I'm changing just a little bit of the format and talking about a little bit more of this raw stuff, because I think some people can read between the lines that I'm definitely looking at current events and talking about, you know, cancel culture. And this this goes on no political spectrum. I don't want to get into politics, but I'm a very independent middle of the road type of person when it does come to stuff that's in the political spectrum. I lean in favor of people's rights to live their lives in in pretty much whatever ways make them happy. It doesn't harm me, doesn't harm anybody else, then so be it. Certain liberties that I think we should all have. And I think we should all support each other in the way that we want to live our lives. That's what makes this country great. And I've seen some amazing stuff in the last few months alone of how these groups that are usually at each other's throats and opposing each other and counter protesting and stuff like that that they're starting to support each other. It's like, you know, I might believe this way, but I completely support your way of of believing. I completely support whatever way you want to live your life and that we shouldn't have overarching reaches on ways that people should live their own lives and support each other for whatever it is they want to do. I've seen some of the most, uh, you know, I guess stereotypically intolerant people be tolerant of others and it's great to see because i feel like the the flames of division are stoked in so many different ways by the society that we have it's stoked in ways of race it's stoked in ways of pol- pol- um, politics it's stoked in so many different ways politics is nothing but division it's why we only have two different we have republican and democrat and you know i see i hear i'm going to politics again but uh people are at each other's throats in that over almost anything else and it's almost like anything that can divide divide us and basically put us against each other is taking our focus off of so many other things that we should be focused on right um, there's so many different things that that we could put our energy to and things that are actually um are actually a threat and things that are 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 stuff we should be paying attention to in this world and we're paying attention to these low level things because they stoke those flames um so talking about stuff like that and basically diving into so many different um you know i guess what i want to say is when they tell you to look this way at something look the other way and those are the other things i want to talk about because those are often the things that are very much suppressed in the world And very often lately, as we saw, like with the extraterrestrial agenda, here we are shooting things out of the sky now. You wouldn't hear about that stuff 20 or 30 years ago. And here we are. They're putting it on mainstream news. They're shooting down unknown objects. And, you know, cover of the New York Times is saying that we have uh, vehicles in our possession that are not of this world. Um, You know, why all of a sudden the narrative change? You know, people have been saying this stuff for decades and they were ostracized killed so many different things happen to people to keep those 
secrets suppressed and so much stuff has been redacted and that's just one example but so many things have been redacted or cut out and this goes back decades it's not just recently those are the things that i want to talk about you know critical thinking is what we should be saying rather than conspiracy theory i cannot stand that word conspiracy theory especially lately how so many quote unquote conspiracy theorists have been vindicated because a lot of the stuff they were saying all along turned out to be true and things keep on happening that way and um you know this this has been going on for such a long time and it's just something i've wanted to talk about from time to time i'm here talking about the inspirational you'll hear i am talking about philosophy in the sense of socrates and i'm relating it back to these things about a uh, conspiracy and, and and critical thinking and the reason why i'm doing that is because those ruling classes, the people who are in power, the people who did know some of the ultimate secrets, whether it came from about uh, you know extraterrestrials all the way down to JFK, because we've had even news stories that have come out very hush hush that like the CIA had far more information than what they originally admitted to and what the um, Warren Commission report on the JFK assassination actually released. So just on something that major on the death and assassination of a president they were willing to lie about those things they lied about obviously we all knew that they were lying about so much stuff that had to do with with extraterrestrials and unknown vehicle cover-ups and all that kind of stuff you know everybody knows about the roswell thing and stuff like that it was just so much cover-ups all the time it's that suppression it's that right there that it is the same type of thing that happened like with Socrates. It is a ruling class, a person in a power structure staying at the top who wants to keep themselves at the top. That knowledge of whatever happened with the president, whatever happened with those vehicles, the knowledge of that keeps them in power. And if everybody knows, they no longer have something that you don't have. That's what makes it valuable. That's what makes precious metals valuable. So it makes, you know, anything that's rare actually valuable in this world is that not everybody can have it. So everybody wants it. That's what makes it valuable. Talking about these things, talking about the stuff that we want to talk about bringing the you know shining the light on some of these things bringing them to the forefront and discussing them not discussing them as a truth like this is the way that it is no no no. it's the way that i present things on this show is a what if because i don't know i wasn't there you weren't there maybe you were but in most cases we weren't in these places these situations these historical writings and teachings to basically say, yes, this is the way that it was. These things are handed down. So I can't stand behind any one person's reputation. I can't stand behind any any particular story and say, this is the way that it is. You should believe me. But we see that happen so much in our society that it's this way and there's no other narrative. I call bullshit on that all the time. I don't believe anyone's narrative. I don't believe anyone's story on anything. I may lean in a certain direction and I will sometimes argue a devil's advocate on a situation that I basically completely agree with. I will just for the sake of almost trying to in a roundabout really messed up way do the confirmation bias thing where I I completely agree with the person I'm arguing with. I just want to hear what reasons they have to believe for what they believe. I want to know that they got information in a similar way that I did and not that not just taking something they heard on face value. Why do you feel that way? Why do you believe that way? I tease that out of a lot of people. I tease that out of people that have worked for me. I tease that of people that I coach. They'll go and say something rhetorical, just completely off the wall that this person did this to me and they just did it to wind me up and I'll say, whoa, 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 stop. Why do you say they did that to wind you up? Explain yourself. Don't just throw things out there. I want to hear it more. I want to, I want more information. And I often do that. And that's what I'm going to do with the podcast is talk about the what ifs. I want to tease things out. I want to talk about these stories and not as fact. It's a what if. What if these things are true? What if our world is this way? What if our reality is this way? Some of the stuff you guys might call woo woo that you've never heard of before that are concepts that it might just blow your mind. What if life really is that way, though? What if some of these things like Einstein called quantum entanglement spooky action at a distance? That was his one of the most brilliant minds of his time. That was the best scientific explanation that he had as to why particles that were separated by huge distances could react to each other faster than the speed of light when that's the ultimate speed limit that was created by his theories of general relativity. 
That guy basically said spooky action at a distance. He couldn't explain it. So there's a lot of things out there that we can't explain. We just need to have a better understanding of them. Well, until we have that better understanding, you can't say that it's one way or another. We are constantly learning and constantly evolving. We are learning so many different things about this reality around us. And we need to just continually keep our minds open, you know, and I guess what ultimately changed, um, what made me want to take a little bit of different of a tra trajectory on this whole thing was, uh, it was really inspired by amazing, my amazing co-host Alexis McQuillan. Like she wanted to get on here and it was one of her first, uh, you know, she came on here and told her story. And then the very first episode that she did where I said, okay, what do you want to talk about? What do you want to do is your first episode? She says, I want to talk about aliens. And my knee jerk reaction was like, oh, well, you know, we don't, we don't really do that. Like that's kind of where I was going with my thought process. And then I'm like, no, hundred percent. Like, yeah, let's totally talk about aliens and extraterrestrial life and UFOs. My knee jerk reaction was more on the side of judgment. Like, Oh, well, you know, people are going to think that's kind of weird. Like, I don't give a shit. I think it's weird. I don't care. It's weird. It's weird that we would think that we're the only things out there given the size of the universe that we know how big it is right now with all these new telescopes and stuff that we're putting up and the things that we're seeing. It's weird that we think we would be the only game in town. We're the only ones out there. You know, what's weird is that we wouldn't talk about those potentials. It, it's weird that we wouldn't explore that fascinating fact that maybe other civilizations are coming to visit us. All that kind of stuff. It's all weird. Let's talk about it. Let's figure out if any of it's true. Thought-provoking stuff. Dig a little bit deeper. See if there's people who are out there that are being suppressed, like Dr. Greer, like a lot of the stuff that he's been talking about for years. How many people out there on a broad range of subjects know about a certain thing and aren't able to, to get on a soapbox and talk about it anywhere because they're afraid of becoming the next version of Socrates? And it was that inspiration from her to talk about this this different subject that inspired me to just say, I'm going to talk about whatever the hell I want to. This is my show. I'm the chief CEO, boss, editor, whatever the hell you want. <laughs> I'm everything on this thing, pretty much. I'm everything but my co-host. You know, I've I've done so much stuff. I have to thank her for inspiring me, though, to talk about all of these different things. Talk about whatever the hell it is that we want to talk about. If it's fascinating and it's inter interesting, it's going to be on here. So you know, we're not one of those podcasts that's typecast down into a certain genre. So I'm not going to put myself in any sort of a box. I'm that kind of a person. I'm always, I've actually always been that kind of a person. And I forced myself into a box for far too long for the sake of a persona that I had to put on, you know, and I even did it once I left law enforcement. I, I left that job, you know, almost five years ago and, you know, I, I broke free a little bit more. I grew my beard. I, I did a little bit more. Um, but then ultimately when I got into politics, I was afraid that people were going to judge this show because I got into this right after I got into politics and I didn't want to go too far off the beaten path. And, um, I'm glad that I made the decision. I've listened to, to advice from people and, um, we're going to, we're going to take it wherever we want to take it, take it off that beaten path and change whatever concepts for the show that we want to. That is living the examined life. That is looking at life in such a, a broad way and just say, my life is this. It's not this. It's not down here in this tiny little square. It is all of it. I like this. I like this. I like this. All over the place. You don't have to typecast yourself down for anybody and you can change who you are at any given moment. You can change any trajectory that you are on at any given moment. You just have to put the energy into it. So that's ultimately why I was inspired to talk about this today was to examine your life, examine whatever the hell it is that you're doing and examine it with a fine tooth comb with a giant magnifying glass and say, I'm happy with this and I love it or I don't like it and I'm changing it right now. Go at it, go at this entire ride with the most authenticity, change the paradigm in your life to go at everything in the most authentic, raw self-aware version that you can possibly imagine. This is something that I didn't realize myself was so valuable. I didn't realize this at all until I realized it was lacking in a major way. And it has been for such a long time. And the only reason I found it was because I had to examine my own life. I had to ask the, the why of why I'm doing anything. You know, I had to, I had to ask that question and ultimately ask myself that question that I ask all of you all the time. What if that, that magic question, what if, 
what if I did something different? What if I, I did whatever the hell it was that I, I wanted to do, do what I want to do, say what I want to say. What if, well, that, that's what life is all about. It's about that. What if. I talked about that in the uh, in the final episode of season three, where I'm asking, who am I? And I'm the person who's going to move in the truest and authentic version. And I'm trying to do the same thing with you all. I'm trying to inspire everybody to ask yourself that same question. You know, ask it far more often than you probably do. I, I know I need to do that more often. And this was my inspiration to do exactly that. I have to basically fight against any any role that life is trying to force me into get away from any typecast that I feel like I'm sliding into at any given point if I recognize that's happening again I did it with the podcast initially too I I was inspired by a few different people I I was very much inspired by some you know shows that I would consider pretty hippie uh, that were kind of out there with different concepts and um, you know, those, those people didn't swear much and those people didn't talk about anything that was, uh, you know, a negative and they, they weren't really real about things and their head was very much in the clouds. Like the world is a very dark and nasty place. And I know that there's the concepts out there that, uh, the world is going to be whatever you think of it, that, that, you know, the universe is emergent from our own consciousness. And I subscribe to that to a certain point, but, I'm sure there's hell not creating some of the things that I might stumble across if I'm scrolling through TikTok. Like I didn't make up that train crash and chemicals floating in a giant chemical cloud over New England. You know, people got sore throats and felt like crap for a couple of days after that happened. I didn't manifest that. I don't want that to happen. So, you know, it, it, there's some limitations to that whimsical, uh, you know, you're only going to, uh, you're only going to create what you observe. So you don't observe everything that's high vibe and stuff. That's not me. That's not me. And that's not realistic. Um, you know, the other thing that's not realistic is that life is always going to be good. And I want to call those things out and life isn't always good. Life is going to suck. Sometimes people are going to die. People are bad. Things are going to happen. You know, accidents happen and misfortunes happen to some people, even the most high vibing people. You're going to tell me they manifested that in some way. I, I don't subscribe to that. And that's, I guess what's changed for me. And I guess I didn't observe those real thoughts, those real concepts, because I was trying to typecast myself into the people who had inspired me to do some of the shows that I'm on. I want to be as high vibe as I can. I believe this world can be a greater place, but I don't think it's going to get there alone. And I don't think it's going to get there by judging other people so much. I do it a lot. I, I, I fully admit it. I am hypocritical in that sense. Uh, I judge a lot of people and I've done it a few times already in this episode, right? Um, and I was just doing it a minute ago about anybody who would have their head in the clouds, but ultimately we need to be, I guess, more real of what's going on and realize that life isn't always going to be good, but it's always going to be life. And that's what live this life is all about. That's what that brand is all about, that it's not always good, but it's, it's always life. And you just have to keep living it. There's a line in the sand that you have to draw when it comes to some of this whimsical stuff and what really happens and basically come to that point of diversion and say, I'm going to be here and I'm going to trudge through it. And I'm going to be here for this other person and help them trudge through it. We're all in this together. So what does it matter if I'm doing good and they're not, that still makes this world an awful place. If this person's going through a hardship and they're not being supported. If more people did that, if more people gave a shit back in Socrates' day, he wouldn't have had a trial to stand. Everybody just watched around, sat around and watched this thing happen. So if we evolve as a species to support each other, to stand together and unite in concepts, unite in ideas, let everybody live a life that means the best for them. doesn't matter what gender expression they want. Does that harm you? No, it doesn't. People need to support each other in the biggest ways and stop caring so much about other people's lives care about your own care that other people are able to be happy in what they do and aim for that for yourself because i've often seen that some of the most judgmental people who are ready to judge people for the life that they're living are often miserable themselves they're throwing that judgment and that shade at other people and they're miserable and pointing out other people's miseries because they're miserable themselves um, so yeah, the difference between that realization of fitting into a typecast and now is 
I just don't give a shit. <laughs> I ultimately just don't care as much as I used to. Um, you know, things definitely are are going to shift and change and they're going to continue to evolve. And, um, you know, I've, I've gotten some great feedback from people in this entire venture that they value that, I guess, lack of, of whimsicalness, that lack of... Uh, of always trying to keep things, you know, your head in the clouds when we all know that it's not always there. You know, so people, uh, it was recently somebody, somebody gave me some awesome feedback about how they approach, uh, they like the way that they approach things with sort of a spiritual badass sort of an approach and that I'm not afraid to call a spade a spade. And so if that's something that listeners of the show admire, then why not be that person? If that's the truest version, authentic version of me, then why not throw that out there? And why not do the same thing yourself? Why not throw that version out there that people are actually going to like? Now, you're not throwing that version out there because you think there's people who aren't going to like it. But ultimately, if you like it, that's all that matters. And there's going to be other people who like that authentic version of you as well. And that, it goes with limitations. You got to be somewhat respectful. You can't be one of those people with, ah, oh, that's just me and I'm just going to say what I want to say that can be harmful to some people as well. We have to, we have to learn some of our limitations and not take it too far <laughs> to a, uh, to an extent that, uh, you know, nobody wants to be around us because we just have this disposition. That's not pleasant. What I'm saying is we have to just examine everything about our lives and figure out the why it is that we're doing anything. You know, our lives are basically a mere reflection of our inner state. So if we're seeing all this negative in the world and we're making other people's lives miserable and, and everything else, what is it that's going on in our own lives? And that's what I think we need to examine. That's basically what I'm saying through the, the entire message of this episode. You know, where are we taking our own lives and what sort of analytical process are we putting into it on a regular basis? Get out of cruise control and look at the kind of thing that's going on in your life. Look at the kind of things that are going on in our world and constantly ask the questions. Ask yourself all sorts of questions. I think we need to do that more often. And as we do, we're going to find more answers. Ask yourself, what if? What if something is this way? What if something is actually this fascinating? You know, what, what does it mean to you in your life if the world is actually this way? What does it mean about our reality? What does it mean about our subjective reality? What does it mean about our collective reality? What if a lot of these crazy conspiracy theorists that have been right about a lot of stuff lately, what if they're all right? You know, one of the, one of the things I can mention before I wrap up, it, just like with the Twitter thing, you know, and I'm not a big fan of Elon Musk, so don't get me wrong on this one, but, uh, you know, they were talking about a whole bunch of stuff that it, it, it basically required him to buy the company and expose their records to prove that those crazy conspiracies were right. So that's just another one, another example that uh, a lot of the stuff they were accusing that was happening behind the scenes there with people's accounts being suppressed. It's all coming out. There's congressional hearings on this stuff that also isn't making much to the light of day. Um, but, you know, basically some of these quacks and kooks all along were right. So maybe we should listen to them just a little bit more because sometimes uh, more often than not lately, they've been making a little bit more sense than some of these people in our in our sort of quote unquote leadership roles. So, um, yeah, that's what I've got. That's what I've got on this subject. And I'd say it's one of the biggest growth edges that I've had in a very long time. You know, considering the uh, the viewpoints of so many different angles of the way you can look at your own life and and see which ways you can grow from it, you know, that uh, that growth is uncomfortable. And when you challenge your own mind just for a minute, even if it's just for a minute, you'll feel what that uncomfortableness feels like. Sometimes when new information comes in that that challenges the way that you, you thought about the world, that new information comes in, it's very uncomfortable. And that cognitive dissonance automatically makes you want to attack where that source came from. And that's where a lot of these conflicts come from. And if you just take for a minute and pause when that, that information comes in, that's not comfortable, something you're not immediately aligned with, look at it and see if it's for whatever reason, you know, why are you thinking this way? And maybe try to digest some of that uncomfortable information because that that uncomfortableness is growth. Like when you're in the gym, like it's not comfortable when you're lifting weights. It's not comfortable when your legs and your arms are starting to burn. You know, it's not comfortable when you're trying to climb to the top of a mountain after two hours. You know, your lungs are burning, your legs are burning, you you're you're exhausted, you're breathing heavy. That's 
ultimately making you stronger. That is growth. You know, the soreness that comes days later, that soreness is growth. So some of those most uncomfortable moments that are in our lives is that growth setting in. And that growth comes from living an examined life. This is why Socrates said what he said, that the unexamined life is not worth living. Uh, he knew it and he was willing to walk the walk on that one. Because if you're not growing, if you're not learning, if you're not examining the life that you have, if you're not stretching and expanding and getting every bit of experience and knowledge that you possibly can out of this incarnation, then, then what are we doing here? We're not living. We're just killing time. So I am going to close this episode up. I'm actually going to drop this uh, amazing uh, this amazing piece of knowledge from one of my favorite modern day philosophers, Jordan Peterson, Dr. Jordan Peterson. He has recently also been somebody who has been on the, the forefront of cancel culture. He is like a modern version of Socrates. The guy is brilliant. And a lot of people trying to demonize him. He's going through cancel culture right now with the Canadian government. They are trying to remove his medical license and have him adhere to uh, like a narrative regurgitation. Like he's got to come up with things the way they say it. And uh, he's being mandated to go through media re-education. And uh, he has to do it to keep his medical license. So basically, um, and all of it's just for, for presenting facts and circumstances that go against an official narrative about certain things. So uh, literally, like a modern day version of Socrates in a modern day unjust, unfair trial and severe punishment is coming down on somebody right in front of our eyes. And we all need to take notice this time and watch what's going up, going on and, and uh, stand up a little bit for it. So here are some wise words from Dr. Jordan Peterson on the trial of Socrates and living the unexamined life. Trial. You know, he was tried by the Athenians for corrupting, for, for failing to worship the correct gods and corrupting the youth of Athens by like teaching them stuff and asking them questions, you know, which is a great way to corrupt people. And, um, so he knew the trial was coming. And Athens wasn't a very big place. It only had about 25,000 people. Everybody knew everybody. And everybody knew who the powerful guys were. And everybody, including Socrates, knew that the trial was a warning to, like, get out of town, right? So we're going to put you on trial in six months. And the potential penalty is death. Got that? It's like... So, so Socrates had a chat with his compatriots, and they were contemplating fair means and foul to set up a defense for him so that he could, or to leave, so that he could not be tried and put to death. And uh, he decided that he wasn't going to do that. And he also decided that he wasn't going to even think about his defense. And he said why, and this is quite an interesting thing. He said why, he told one of his friends that he had this voice in his head Damon, a spirit, something like that, um, that he always listened to and that that was one of the reasons he was different from other people, because he always listened to this thing. It didn't tell him what to do, but it told him what not to do. It always told him what not to do. And if it told him not to do something, then he didn't do it. If he was speaking and the little voice came up and said, no, then he shut up and he tried to say something else. And he was very emphatic about this. And he said that when he tried to plan to evade the trial or even to mount his own defense the voice came up and said no don't bother with it and he thought well what what do you, what the hell do you mean by that like there's a trial coming and i'm gonna be put to death and well he eventually concluded that he was an old guy you know the next 10 years he was in his 70s perhaps the next 10 years weren't going to be that great for him he got a chance, maybe the gods were giving him a chance just to bow out, you know, to put his affairs in order, to say goodbye to everyone, to avoid that last descent into catastrophe, which might have been particularly painful for a philosopher, and to, and to walk off the world on his own terms, something like that. The point I'm making with that is that Socrates attended to this internal voice that at least told him what not to do, and then he didn't do it. And of course, Socrates was a very remarkable man, and we still hear about him today, and we know that he existed, and all of those things. And so, back to the, back to the walking with God idea. You know, as you elevate your aim, you 
create a judge at the same time, right? Because the new ideal, which is an ideal you, even if it's just an ideal position that you might occupy, even if it's still conceptualized in that concrete way, that becomes a judge because it's above you, right? And then you're, you're terrified of it, maybe. That's why you might be afraid when you go start a new job, right? Because you're, this thing is above you and you're terrified of it and it judges you. And that's useful because the, the judge that you're creating by formulating the ideal tells you what's useless about yourself and then you can dispense with it. And you want to keep doing that and then every time you make a judge that's more elevated, then there's more useless you that has to be dispensed with. And then if you create an ultimate judge, which is what the archetypal imagination of humankind has done, say, with the figure of Christ, because if Christ is nothing else, he is at least the archetypal perfect man and therefore the judge. You have a judge that says, get rid of everything about yourself that isn't perfect. And of course, that's also what Abraham, that's also what God tells Abraham, right? He says to be perfect, to pick an ideal that's high enough and you can do this. The thing that's interesting about this, I think, is you can do it more or less on your own terms. You have to have some collaboration from other people, but you don't have to pick an external ideal. You can pick an ideal that fulfills the role of ideal for you. You can say, okay, well, if things could be set up for me the way I need them to be, and if I could be who I needed to be, what would that look like? And you can figure that out for yourself, and then instantly you have a judge. And I also think that's part of the reason people don't do it, right? Why don't, why don't people look up and move ahead? And the answer is, well, you know, you start formulating an ideal, you formulate a judge, it's pretty easy to feel intimidated in the face of your own ideal. That's what happens to Cain versus Abel, for example. Then it's really easy to destroy the ideal instead of to try to pursue it because then you get rid of the judge. But it's way better. Lower the damn judge if it's too much. Like if your current ambition is crushing you, you know, then maybe you're playing the tyrant to yourself and you should tap down your ambitions, not get rid of them by any stretch of the imagination, but at least put them more reasonably within your grasp. You don't have to leap from point one to point 50 in one leap, right? You can do it incrementally. But I really like this idea. I think it's a profound idea that the process of recapitulating yourself continually is also the process of, it's a phoenix-like process, right? You're shedding all those elements of you that are no longer worthy of the pursuits that you're, that you're valuing. And then I would say the idea here is that as you do that, you shape yourself ever more precisely into something that can withstand the tragedy of life and that can act as a, as a beacon to the world. That's the right way of thinking about it. Maybe first to your friends and then to your family. It's like it's a hell of a fine ambition and there's no reason that it can't happen. You know, every one of you knows people who are really bloody useful in a crisis and people that you admire, right? Those are all you can think of all those people as you admire, that you admire as partial incarnations of the archetypal Messiah. That's exactly right. And the more that that manifests itself in any given person, then the more generally useful and admirable that person is in a multitude of situations. And we don't know the limit to that. But people can be unbelievably good for things, you know? It's really something to behold. So I'm going to leave it with that. And going forward, I'm challenging you to expand your thoughts and open your mind towards any and all possibilities, whether it's about the truth of a situation, the truth of the world, the truest version of yourself in your life. I want you to answer that all important question. What if, what if you examined life? What, what kind of experience, what kind of limitless and unapologetic existence awaits you on the other side of that examination when you stop thinking the way that others want you to think and you stop saying what other people want you to say and you truly begin to live this life. The unexamined life is not worth living. So examine every single thing that comes up in your life and don't take any of it for its face value. Don't take anything for granted and stand up for your fellow person no matter what your belief system is because we all deserve the chance to examine the trajectory that we have in our own life right now and take it in whatever direction we want to take it so i'm going to leave you with the rest of the song that i featured throughout this episode and uh, this one is from one of our newest artists his name is jay malik and this one is called bloom
this life requires self-examination to make sure that you're living it to its highest potential and truest purpose for why you came here so you can live a life and take it into full bloom. So examine your life day in and day out and keep living. Welcome back, everybody. <laughs>